All right, um, I think we can get started. So hello everyone, welcome to ASIC seminar series. Uh, this is John, the seminar coordinator. And together with me is Ms. Kathy Medley. Kathy is our communication specialist. And Kathy and I will be today's moderator. And we are excited to have our speaker, Dr. Scott Brown, joining us from NASA Gather. Just so you know, then the seminar is being recorded and uh, it will be later published on our YouTube channel. Please be free to ask questions. You can do so um, by send us message through chat or, or you can raise your virtual hands and we will unmute you. Uh, let me um, first introduce the speaker. So Dr. Scott Brown is um, a research meteorologist and NASA's um, Goddard Space Flight Center. He is a project scientist for NASA's GPM and tropics mission and science team lead for the impacts Earth winter suborbital campaign. And he is also a member of the science and applications leadership team for NASA's aerosol cloud convection and precipitation study. He was previously project scientist for the trim satellite and principal investigators for the hurricane and severe storm Santillo HS3 airborne investigation. He received his PhD in atmospheric science from University of Washington in 1995 and became an AMS fellow in um, 2018. All right, um, I will give the board to Dr. Um, Scott Brown and Dr. Brown, please um, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So um, this is a version of a talk that I gave at Goddard. I pretty much guarantee it was over a year ago now since we've been in lockdown for uh, a long time. But uh, for those who saw it at Goddard, there are some new things here, but there's also some stuff that you will have seen before. But hopefully for the most of you, it's all new. Uh, so I wanted to give uh, kind of an overview of um, tropical cyclone measurements, in particular precipitation measurements from a number of missions uh, that I've been fortunate to play a role in. Um, and that's sort of what this is viewed as kind of a review of the past, what's going on now, and a look toward the, both the near and farther future. <clears throat> I'm get this to advance. Hold on. There you go. Um, so in, in this talk, uh, I'll cover four main topics here. Uh, a lot of the science that I'll give in terms of results will be related to trim. Uh, with GPM, I think there's there's some new science, um, not as much as what we saw with trim, uh, but I'll focus a bit more on applications. I think there's a more of an applications emphasis with GPM. Uh, Tropics is a, a mission that we expect to launch, uh, begin launching a little bit more than a year from now. Uh, and then the aerosols, clouds, convection, precipitation observing system is a study that we just completed and we're, we're starting to move into phase A, but it's, it's kind of looking toward later in the decade in terms of measurements. So let's start with TRIM. Uh, as most of you know, it launched in November 1997. And um, while it was planned for a three to five year mission, it, it, it ended up going uh, almost 17 and a half years. So it was a, a great mission for its longevity. It was also great in terms of the comprehensiveness of the measurements that were involved. And we had the first precipitation radar in space. We had a very capable microwave imager on it for helping the map precipitation. But we also had a lightning imaging sensor to be able to uh, better measure where uh, lightning was occurring with respect to deep convection and what those properties of convection were. Uh, there was a visible and infrared scanner to get at cloud properties and, and also a clouds and earth um, radiant energy system uh, for radiant budget. Uh, unfortunately, the series instrument didn't last beyond uh, the first year. Uh, but it was a pretty complete system as all things are concerned. And, and again, it, it provided some of the first 3D imagery of hurricanes that was uh, possible other than by um, aircraft. And, and in this particular example here, you can even see where some of the lightning occurred. Here's the eye wall over here, and there's lightning out in this outer band. So it, it provides a lot of capability uh, in one package. TRIM had a 35 degree um, inclined orbit. 
which meant that we were able to get, you know, reasonably uh, rapid uh, updates to um, overpasses. You can get several within a day compared to the polar orbiting satellites. So uh, that made it particularly valuable for tracking storms because you could see it several times a day. Um, just kind of an overview of some of the, the science and applications here relative to tropical cyclones. Um, at one point, I think it was Bob uh, Adler had gotten somebody to give him an estimate of how many center fixes you would get uh, in, a, in a typical year globally. And it was on the order of five to 600 center fixes per year that came from TRIM. Um, and so that, as a result, it played uh, a, a pretty good role in, in operational monitoring of storms. Uh, but but TRIM's real advantage here was in being able to develop a climatology of rainfall within tropical cyclones. Prior to that, most of the rainfall inf information that we had, particularly 3D structure, uh, was from airborne data. And it took years, if not a couple decades, to build up a reasonable climatology of precipitation structure information. And TRIM was able to do that in a relatively short time because of its uh, global observations. Uh, it provided information on the radial distribution of, of uh, precipitation and how that varied as a function of storm intensity. Um, information on shear and motion induced asymmetries, which are illustrated on the, the right side. Now, that diagram uh, from Lundfeld et al. shows for different ocean basins what the asymmetric structure of storms would look like. So what they've done is a climatology in each ocean basin. And they remove the 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 azimuthal mean, so you're you're seeing how it varies from the that azimuthal mean, uh, and we tend to see these fairly substantial asymmetries that have been uh, over the years related to the direction and magnitude of the vertical wind shear, and to a lesser extent the storm motion. Um, it gave us a lot of great information on rain band vertical structure and the occurrence of lightning within these storms. Uh, and one of the things I'll be showing today relates to uh, what's called a precipitation feature database um, that ultimately provided a lot of inf information about convective systems in general, but in particular for hurricanes. Now, for data assimilation, I, I think TRIM was a little bit ahead of its time. Uh, there, there were efforts at assimilation of radiance data, uh, but not, you know, generally it would have been limited primarily to, I think, clear sky assimilation. Uh, and there were some efforts at radar assimilation, but um, not not as much as I think we're capable of doing now. Uh, and then one of the other nice things that came out of, of TRIM was with its 10 gigahertz channel, we were able to see um, or get measurements of sea surface temperature beneath clouds, you know, compared to say uh, other approaches prior to that where you couldn't see beneath the clouds and you had to wait for the storm to clear out before you could see impacts on the ocean. But with TRIM, you could see the, the cooling of the ocean in the wake of the storms as it was happening, and that, that was really nice. So I'm going to show some uh, results from a, a number of studies. Uh, we'll start with a paper by Henson Howes uh, that looked at trim PR data, uh, precipitation radar data, over a large number of storms. Um, and they, they looked at these contoured frequency by alti altitude diagrams that have uh, radar reflectivity on the x-axis, height, on the vertical axis, and, and what you're seeing are contours of frequency of occurrence of a particular reflectivity at a particular height. So it's basically the PDF at a given height of the ref reflectivity values, and then they're just stacked on top of each other for different heights. And in this study, they found that storms, uh, stronger storms, had deeper and uh, and more intense modal and outlier reflectivity distributions in weaker storms. So th this is sort of the, the modal value in here in, in the contours and the extremes are on the right edge. And, and that tended to be greater for the stronger storms. And because the intensity of the storm is often connected to the underlying uh, sea surface temperatures, they also found a similar pattern for higher sea surface temperatures than for lower sea surface temperatures. What I wanted to, to highlight in this particular figure though, is the relationship with respect to the vertical wind shear vector. And the plot in the upper right here is from a simulation study that I did, uh, but it illustrates the relationship between the shear vector and, and precipitation um, in a hurricane. So if the shear director, as in this example, is directed to the northeast, this is the down shear side of the storm on that northeast side, up shear to the southwest. And then we usually refer to it as down shear right, down shear left, 
up shear left and up shear right. And, and we see a particular distribution with respect to the shear that convection tends to get initiated up she down shear and starts to go away up shear. And that the heaviest precipitation tends to be on this on the left side of the storm relative to the shear vector. So Henson Howes use a large composite of the PR data to look at the vertical structure within each of these quadrants. And let's start with this up shear right quadrant, which tends to have the least amount of precipitation. There's still some convection in there, but it, it, it's at a minimum. And so when you look at the uh, rate of occurrence of given reflectivities, you see with the area of yellow that it tends to be shifted more toward lower values, 35 dBZ and less. Um, you still get some extreme values out here at or above 50 dBZ, uh, but values uh, in the, say, the 40 to 50 dBZ range are, are lower. As you get into this down shear white right quadrant, you start to see the formation of intense convective cells in the rain bands. Uh, that's illustrated by the shift in the yellow contours to at least 40 dBZ and a little bit beyond at low levels. Um, and you can see by the fact that these contours are, are fairly vertical here, that that's a, a sign of the fact that convection is really starting to get initiated in this down shear right quadrant. It then gradually moves around into the down shear left and continues to grow as those updrafts rise to the upper troposphere. And in that up shear or down shear left quadrant now, we see that the modal part of the distribution has shifted toward higher values. Uh, you know, in the down shear right, it was at near 30. Now it's getting toward 35 to or so dBZ. The area of yellow is pushed even farther to the right uh, in this area. Um, so we're, we're, at this point, we're seeing uh, the heaviest and, and most widespread precipitation. And then as we get into this up shear left quadrant, you still get some of that heavier eye wall precipitation, but a lot of that starts to rain out. And what we see is kind of a collapse in those deep convective towers and the highest reflectivities are really focused more down at low levels. And we're seeing a shift in the distribution back to the left toward lower values. And so that's consistent with the patterns that we were seeing in models. And with this study, they were able to show this evolution of the vertical structure of the storms as a function of vertical wind shear. Um, next, I wanna to shift to a number of studies that looked at hurricanes from this precipitation feature database. This database was developed by the University of Utah, and it started off just looking at all convective systems. And what they did was they would define a precipitation feature. It might be defined based on either the radar or the passive microwave. And let's take this particular example here. And they could, for each of these uh, contiguous features, they can come up with various statistics about it. It might be the maximum reflectivity in the column, or the area covered by reflectivity above a certain threshold, the minimum 85 gigahertz brightness temperature or beers uh, brightness temperature and, and a number of things like that. And all that would get thrown into a database that included all precipitation features uh, observed by TRIM, you know, these larger ones as well as smaller ones. And then one can query the database to look at uh, various characteristics of convection globally, uh, and, and that led to a number of uh, very important papers. But what I want to focus on here is a subset of this database that that extracted all of the tropical cyclones from it and used that um, to form a tropical cyclone precipitation feature database. And again, that includes information from PR, TMI, VIRS, and LIS. So let's start by looking at the diurnal cycle uh, in a paper by Zhang et al. You know, with TRIM, there have been earlier studies that looked at the evolution of the uh, diurnal cycle of convection in general. Uh, this was one of the first to look at tropical cyclones in particular, and they divided it up into tropical depressions, tropical storms, and hurricanes. And clearly in tropical depressions and storms, you can see this peak around 6 o'clock a.m. local time versus a minimum in, uh, in the late afternoon. It was a little harder to see for hurricanes uh, on top of the other distributions. So I added the red line here and you can clearly see that it also applies to these hurricanes. So again, an early morning peak in volumetric rainfall and a minimum in the uh, evening hours. Um, after this study, um, Jason Dunyon um, had been doing some work with GOES data to look at the diurnal cycle within uh, hurricanes. And one of the things that he was seeing in the GOES data was 
kind of a burst of convection in the inner core region near the center that would then propagate out with time. Uh, and he referred to this, I think, something like the diurnal clock or something like that for, for uh, hurricanes. And so Leopard and Cecil wanted to see if we could find similar behavior in the rainfall data. Because what, what you're seeing with GOES is just the outward propagation of cloud features, mostly through the cloud top. And there were some questions about whether that corresponded to the evolution of rain band features moving outward with time as well. So Leopard and Cecil used the radar data to look at the diurnal cycle. Uh, they looked at multiple heights, and, and I've shown these here for uh, looking at the percent anomaly of area covered by reflectivities greater than 20 dBZ, and, and this plot just for hurricanes. Uh, at two kilometers, you can see a little bit of a diurnal cycle, but it's relatively weak. And let's just focus at the eight kilometer level, because I think that's a little bit easier to see. So again, this plot is showing the percent anomaly. So it's, re it's removed the mean uh, uh, frequency of reflectivities greater than 20. And they've looked at three different uh, ranges from the center. So they looked at the inner core from zero to 100 kilometers. That would include the eye wall. They looked at a, another an annulus from 100 to 300 kilometers, and, and then farther out, 300 to 500 kilometers. Uh, and you can see the legend down here. Um, and so in the inner core, there was a peak in the percent coverage of 20 dBZ or greater uh, around midnight local standard time. Um, about six or so hours later, that peak would have shifted outward to 100 to 300 kilometers. And by late in the day, uh, it would be seen at 300 to 500 kilometers. So they are seeing a diurnal cycle uh, in the precipitation structure, one in which there is a clear progression outward, although there, it doesn't seem uh, to be a, quite a linear motion here. Um, but they are, it could be that the reason it takes so long to get out to these outer radii is perhaps the progression slows uh, as it gets out to some limiting radius. Uh, but this was at least confirmation of a diurnal cycle in the precipitation features themselves, rather than just the cloud upper cloud structure. Uh, this is from a, a paper by Tao and Zhang from 2013, looking at the uh, occurrence of overshooting tops. So as many of you know, an overshooting top is associated with deep convection when it penetrates above its equilibrium level. Often this would be associated with the tropopause, but it, not, not always. Uh, and they wanted, to see how frequently these overshooting tops occur in convection and tropical cyclones, uh, in particular in the eye wall, because there's been a, a number of studies that have looked at what we call hot towers or convective bursts within the eye wall and how that might relate to storm intensification. And this was one way of getting at um, you know, the occurrence of those convective towers. So they defined in these plots the percentage of overshooting tops as just being the percent of precipitation features that have overshooting tops. And they looked at in three different regions, the eye wall, the inner core, which could be the eye wall, or it might be, if there is no well-defined eye wall, it's just the convection close to the center. Um, and then from the outer edge of that inner core convection, um, they defined inner, band, inner rain band structures as being from the outer edge of the eye wall to 100 kilometers, and then outer bands was anything out beyond that to, from 150 to 500 kilometers. And so if you look at this first plot here, it's showing um, the percent of overshooting tops for all regions, inner core, inner bands, and outer bands. And this is for different ocean basins. So you can see clearly that the inner core region by far has the greatest percentage of these overshooting tops. Uh, and it's much lower in the inner bands and outer bands. This might in part be related to the, the fact that you know, the hurricane uh, secondary circulation is associated with an in, up, and, and out overturning circulation, and that the outward part is associated with that central dense overcast. And it's possible that that changes things in a way that the, the inner band and outer bands can't generate the same depth of convection as you might get uh, in the eye wall itself. Uh, they also were finding that the highest free, uh, occurrence of these overshooting tops was in the uh, Eastern Pacific, uh, or sorry, Northwest Pacific and the South Pacific, and the Atlantic actually had the lowest percentage uh, of overshooting tops. They also looked at this in terms of storm, in storm intensity with tropical depressions having the smallest number 
uh, then growing for tropical storms, peaking for category one and two hurricanes, and then uh, dropping down a little bit for cat three to five hurricane storms. And that might be just an indicator of the fact that by the time you get to a, a very mature storm, um, there's not a lot of convective available potential energy left and the circulation is more slantwise convection. And so that may limit to some extent the overshooting tops that you can get. And then this last panel is in terms of the intensification rate. And you see that for rapid intensif intensification events, you get the highest frequency of overshooting tops. And then that decreases as you go to steady intensification, neutral to weakening storms. Uh, so that, that sort of confirms the idea that the intensification rate of storms may have to do with, to some extent, with um, the vertical circulation associated with these convective bursts. Uh, and then you can extend going from overshooting tops to lightning within storms. They, uh, Zhang et al. looked at um, the occurrence of lightning uh, normalized by, by different factors. So flashes per raining area or volumetric rain, the 85 gigahertz brightness temperature, or you know, more the extreme values of the 85 gigahertz <clears throat> with lower brightness temperatures being associated with stronger convection. And let, let's just look at the the flashes per raining area here. And here they divided it up again as a function of storm intensity and inner core region, inner bands and outer bands. And similar to the overshooting tops, we're generally finding uh, the most lightning associated with the inner core. Um, the most frequent lightning is actually with category three to five storms, uh, which surprises me a bit because I would normally think that those would be storms that again, have more slantwise convection, and, and weaker vertical updrafts. So that's kind of an, uh, an interesting finding. Um, and then the category one to two storms, for whatever reason, have a, a lower occurrence of lightning, even though they had a high occurrence of overshooting tops. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the tropical storms and tropical depressions also had uh, fairly active uh, lightning associated with them. And in particular, when you look at the outer and inner, uh, the inner, inner bands, at least, they were particularly active in tropical storms and depressions and not so active uh, in the hurricane region, whereas in the outer bands, it was kind of uniform across. <clears throat> this plot on the right is just showing the cumulative distribution of uh, the probability of lightning as a function of the minimum 85 gigahertz brightness temperature. Again, the lower the 85 gigahertz brightness temperature, the more intense the convection typically. And they're comparing here also to just typical tropical oceanic precipitation. So normally uh, with tropical convection, as the 85 gigahertz brightness temperature gets colder, the probability of lightning goes up. But what you'll see for both for all of the different regions of the tropical cyclone, but in particular for the inner core region, you have to get to much colder 85 gigahertz brightness temperatures, which means greater ice scattering, which typically implies stronger convection to get the same probability of lightning occurrence as you would get in typical oceanic uh, convection. Now, let's now move on to GPM. Now, GPM launched in 2014. We just this past uh, week reached the seventh anniversary of TRIM's launch, or sorry, GPM's launch. Um, GPM had a, a few key advances over TRIM. One is with the radar. Uh, TRIM was just a KU band radar. GPM carries the, the dual frequency precipitation radar, which has KA and KU band. And that uh, multi-frequency capability allows us to say something not just about the rainfall rates within storms, but actually something about the particle size distributions within the storms. Um, and then the other advance was with the radiometer, which provided um, higher resolution, better calibration and higher frequency channels near 166 gigahertz and 183 gigahertz that improves measurements of light rain and snowfall. Um, GPM also has a 65 instead of a 35 degree inclination orbit. So we're able to see storms as they move up into the mid latitudes. The downside though, is that by being at such a high inclination at 65, we get far fewer overpasses of storms. And that might explain, or at least what I've seen so far, of not as many studies of, of tropical cyclones uh, in the literature uh, as we saw for TRIM. Now, part of that may just be TRIM set the bar and, and had such a uh, wide uh, amount of studies related to it that there wasn't as much to be done for GPM. Um, 
one of the things that I think is notable with GPM is just how widely it's used for applications. So for the most part, when I talk about GPM today, it'll be about those applications. But I did want to show one science result that relates to the dual frequency precipitation radar and its ability to see particle size distributions. So this is a, a study by Wong et al. that um, looks at uh, tropical cyclones globally. And on the left are, are shown plots of the mean diameter as a function of the number concentration of particles for both stratiform regions and convective regions within tropical cyclones. And as you would expect, you know, stratiform regions tend to be more horizontally homogeneous. And so most of the values are concentrated within a more limited range uh, here, here between about one and one and a half millimeters uh, and 30 to 40 uh, in number concentration. Whereas convection, you can see the values are, are spread over a much wider range. Uh, um, on the right over here are plots showing the vertical structure in terms of reflectivity on the top and uh, mean diameter on the bottom for both convective and stratiform regions. And I've just drawn this red line in here to mark one and a half millimeters. Uh, it just helps to better see the differences between convective and stratiform. So for stratiform, it's a much narrower distribution for particle size. Uh, most values below between one and one and a half. Uh, and only a, a limited number of cases getting much higher than one and a half millimeters. Whereas convection values range from about one to almost three millimeters. Um, and the, the modal value here is greater than one and a half. So you're, you're generally seeing the larger raindrops as, as one might normally expect to see in, in deep convection. Next, I want to move on to the uh, GPM applications. And, and GPM has had a, a very robust applications program thanks to the leadership of Dahlia Kirschbaum and, and help from uh, Andrea uh, Portier. Uh, it covers a number of different themes from ecology, weather and agriculture, and so on. Uh, but obviously, disasters and weather uh, apply most to tropical cyclones. And most of our users are in the weather and disasters area. They account for about 50% of users. Water and agriculture uh, accounts for about a quarter, and then everything else falls within that last quarter. <clears throat> so for hurricanes, G GMI has been useful, just like with trim, for tracking storm position and structure. Uh, the GPM data uh, are available in AWIPS for forecasters to look at in real time. So that aids uh, its use in monitoring storms. Uh, and again, like with trim and other uh, satellites within the microwave constellation, the Naval Research Lab uh, ha maintains a tropical cyclone webpage where these imagery are available in real time. Uh, and finally, we're starting to see data use in data assimilation uh, in a more effective way with, with all sky radiance assimilation. And I wanted to show an example of that. Uh, this is from Goddard, Min Jung Kim's work within the Goddard Modeling and Assimilation Office. Uh, the group there has done just amazing work to get the data implemented within the GEOS system, the data simulation system there, um, doing all sky assimilation for GMI, and they've been adding in other constellation members uh, as well, so that soon the entire microwave constellation will be involved in this all sky assimilation. So the results that I'm showing here are uh, the forecast impact of, of GMI. Um, as a function of forecast hour and altitude, uh, and the color shading here indicates degradation in the darker colors and improvement uh, in the warmer colors. And you can see that for specific humidity, GMI leads to general improvements of the forecast out to at least three days uh, and at all heights. Um, the stippling indicates where things are statistically significant. And they also find similar improvements and the tropical mid and lower tropospheric temperature and wind fields. Um, the lower panel shows the impact of the different data sets that are listed here per observation. So um, they, they did a test and G, GPM GMI is at the top in terms of the, of the impact per observation. And of course, the total impact in a forecasting system then would de depend on the number of observations that are available. But what it shows is that uh, good quality imagers such as GMI, when you're doing all sky assimilation, can be very impactful within these forecast systems. 
Now, our data product that has been most useful uh, for applications is the iMERGE product. Um, it is by far our most downloaded product and its use has grown over the years since it first came out um, with version five of the, of the uh, GPM products. Uh, and it's, it's used in all those different focus areas that I mentioned before. And I'd like to just show this animation because it's from the 2017 season. And you'll see a number of significant storms here that you can follow and, and just watch it while I get another drink of water. Sorry. So the, here's Harvey as it's approaching the Texas and then the way it'll hang out around uh, the Houston area. Uh, it gives us a way to not only monitor storms as they happen in terms of the instantaneous rainfall, but also to eventually look at rainfall accumulations from these individual storms. Here comes Hurricane Irma as it's as made its destructive path through the Caribbean. Many of you remember the, the islands here that had been almost stripped clean uh, from the impacts of Irma. And then later on, you'll see Hurricane Maria form. I think it's from this disturbance. Um, let's see if that's right. Yeah, here's Maria as it uh, heads toward uh, Puerto Rico. So this product. Uh, provides information on a half hour a time scale and a 10th of a degree resolution and it's been uh, used in a number of different applications and I'm just showing one here. So by using um, this data set, you can uh, compute the total accumulation along the path of the storm. Um, and we have a number of users who can take advantage of this. One is the global disaster alert and coordination system. They have a, an emergency response map that where you can uh, show the iMERGE precipitation along with statistics on uh, the impact of the storm in different regions, whether it's in terms of fatalities, injured people, evacuations, and things of that nature. So it's it's, it's part of a decision support system for uh, providing emergency relief. Another example taken locally here from the University of Maryland uh, through Bob Adler's group's efforts is the global flood monitoring system. Uh, this was an example from 2019 of a tropical cyclone that made landfall in Africa. Uh, and in the system, they are able to take the input rainfall and compute stream flow and inundation. And this is just showing the inundation along uh, many of the different streams or rivers uh, and the, the higher inundation in some of these regions. So this is a really nice example of a, an application of the data set. Okay, now moving on to the near future with the tropics. It's called the time resolved observations of precipitation structure and storm intensity with a constellation of small sats. You run out of breath trying to get through that acronym, um, but it's an appropriate acronym because like TRIM, it's focused just in the tropics. Uh, it'll be in a 30 degree inclination uh, and it'll be a constellation of about six satellites uh, to provide rapid revisit observations of tropical cyclones globally. Um, it's a, a microwave uh, Im imager and sounder uh, and a very small package uh, that allows for the launch of multiple satellites in, in, for a relatively low cost. The, the total mission cost, I think, is on the order of uh, 31 million or so. Uh, so the science objectives, uh, I should mention also that uh, tropics uh, it, it was funded under the NASA Earth Venture Instrument Program with Bill Blackwell from MIT Lincoln Lab as the principal investigator, and I am the, I'm the, the project scientist or science team lead uh, for the Tropics mission. And it involves a, a pretty broad community uh, of people, uh, folks at the University of Wisconsin who are handling some of our algorithms, uh, Goddard, who's uh, responsible for the rainfall algorithm, and uh, several NOAA folks involved in uh, some of the modeling and um, applications uses of the data sets. So in terms of the science objectives, uh, two of them relate to the relationship between precipitation structure and storm evolution. One is relating precipitation structure evolution, including the diurnal cycle to the evolution of the upper level warm core and the associated intensity changes. And the other is looking at the role of convective bursts in storm intensification. And I like to show this plot, which is just a set of Hobmuller diagrams showing radius versus time. Uh, this is from a, a hurricane wharf simulation, or actually it's, it's a wharf nature run simulation that uh, NOAA and the University of Miami generated. 
And the first plot here is showing rainfall, uh, showing the development of the eye wall, and you can see these outward propagating rain bands. The next three panels show uh, brightness temperature at three different frequencies that tropics will use. Uh, and you can see how the eye wall and these outer rain bands are represented in, in these microwave data. And then the last plot is just showing the time series of storm intensity in terms of the minimum sea level pressure. And what we hope to do then is relate this intensity evolution to the observed structures, uh, either within the brightness temperature or within retrieved rainfall rates. We're also looking to relate the environmental moisture uh, properties to measures of storm structure and size or, or size and intensity. Um, this is an example of what we think the retrievals will look like from uh, tropics. This is uh, developed from an Aussie uh, and uh, it allows us, this is a 850 water vapor mixing ratio and it allows us, for example, see dry air associated with the Saharan air layer as well as the more moist conditions in the area. Uh, of the developing tropical cyclone. These higher values here are likely too high as a result of uh, scattering effects um, in the radiometer. But for the most part, uh, we've confirmed by comparing to the original model fields that these humidity dis uh, distributions are, are quite reasonable. And uh, we'll be getting storm intensity estimates from the University of Wisconsin algorithm. Uh, it's an algorithm they developed for AMSU and ATMS to estimate storm intensity from the brightness temperatures, and they are applying that algorithm uh, to tropics to get very rapid revisit uh, estimates of storm intensity. And so by combining these two data sets, we hopefully will be able to show to what extent, for example, intrusions of dry air play a role in perhaps limiting storm intensification. <clears throat> and then the last uh, objective relates to the impact of um, the data sets in terms of data assimilation into different numerical models, whether it's the Hurricane Wharf model at NOAA or potentially the, the GS model at Goddard and GFS at NOAA. Uh, and we're also looking at trying to use the observations as a way of informing the statistical uh, hurricane intensity prediction system or SHIPS model. Uh, it, it uses a number of parameters that are observed or taken from models and relates that statistically to the likelihood of intensification. Um, and we think that we're hoping that having the rapid revisit observations will provide added skill for that model. So here's a bit of information about uh, the tropic sensors. Uh, this is what they look like. They're, they're fairly small. It's a three unit CubeSat with the, the, the solar array here. The radiometer is in this unit. It's about a third of the package. And then the spacecraft bus, the batteries, reaction wheels, and everything else are in, in here in the data system. Um, this is an example of ATMS, but uh, we expect to have basically the same spatial resolution as ATMS. So this is the type of structure you might see. Uh, at, I think this is 183 gigahertz. And, and then this, the animation that's shown down here is, is just uh, from the wharf nature run that we did all, uh, we, we did simulated orbit orbits, and this is showing what these orbits would look like over the life cycle of the storm within the nature run model. Uh, here at, at this point, the storm is going through an eye wall replacement cycle. So the package has uh, 12 channels, seven uh, near 118 gigahertz for temperature profiling, three near 183 gigahertz for moisture profiling, and then imaging at 92 and 205 gigahertz. Uh, it, as I mentioned, I'll have ATMS-like resolution, so about 17 kilometers at the moisture channels and 205 gigahertz, about 25 kilometers or so at 118 gigahertz, and a little coarser at 92 gigahertz. Uh, with the six satellites, th those will be two satellites in each of three orbital planes. If you were to throw all six into one, a single orbital plane, when they cross over a storm, you would get rapid, very rapid revisits, but then you could have very long gaps between those revisits. And so by having multiple orbital planes, you're able to spread them out and, and reduce the median revisits to less than 50 minutes. A lot of times they may be as, as low as 15 minutes or so. And we also tried to minimize the number of larger gaps. So I, I believe the numbers are such that it's about um, a third of the time we'll have gaps uh, larger than two hours. Uh, and that's about the best that we can do with just six satellites. Uh, MIT built seven of these. One was the qualification unit and then six for the constellation. And we recently got approval from headquarters to launch 
the qualification unit as a Pathfinder mission, and that will ride that'll go up on a ride share this summer. Uh, it'll will make the data available to early adopters, and it will help us to uh, use the data with some of our algorithms to just fine tune the algorithms before the full constellation goes up. And we just found out this past week that NASA has, has selected and announced the launch company for uh, the full constellation. And I don't remember offhand the name of the company, but the launch um, will be done. There'll be three launches over a 120 day period between January and July of 2022. And the launches will be done from the Quadrant Atoll in the Pacific. I was hoping for something closer to home to be able to go to the launches, but uh, unfortunately, it's well out in the Pacific. Uh, this is just a description of some of the products from Tropics that so will um, be releasing, obviously, the calibrated brightness temperatures. And then for level two products, we'll have retrieved temperature and humidity profiles in the non-raining areas. And uh, in the precipitating areas, we expect to provide a scattering index, as well as an estimate of the rainfall rates. Uh, the rainfall rate algorithm is, is similar to what is used by, for the severe uh, Saphir uh, instrument for megatropics in the GPM constellation. And as I mentioned, we'll also get storm intensity estimates. Um, we are not funded to provide data in real time uh, as just a research mission, uh, although we are trying to optimize the latency. Um, we have our ground station, um, one in South Africa that we're utilizing. And so after passes over the Atlantic, we can try to download some of that data um, we think we can get about half of the data down in, in near real time, and then the rest would come down much later. But we're working with headquarters and, and talking to other organizations in the community to try to see if we can get investments to fund uh, additional ground stations. We're, we're a cost cap mission, and we don't have the budget to fund these ground stations, so we're looking for support from uh, other organizations to perhaps provide to fund that. Um, improvement in latency. So the, the last topic today then is ACCP, which stands for aerosols, clouds, convection, and precipitation. Um, it was a study done over the last couple of years in response to the uh, 2017 uh, decadal survey that NASA did. Uh, the decadal survey uh, identified five designated observables uh, three of which were related to uh, the surface and two to the atmosphere. So and those were aerosols and clouds convection and precipitation. And headquarters, when they asked us to do the study, also asked that we combine them uh, given the uh, strong coupling between aerosols and clouds and precipitation. And so that's what we did over the last couple of years with this study. And I just wanted to highlight, I think, what, what we've identified as some of the Five, the five first ever's for ACCP um, based on what we're trying to do with, with the mission. So one is the first global observations of vertical motion within convection. Uh, we are going to include Doppler radars um, on these um, satellites that uh, are able to get vertical motions within convection. Um, EarthCare does have a Doppler radar, but it's W band only, so it won't be able to penetrate convection much. Um, and so uh, that's why we, we sort of argue that we're the, the first to do this, at least for convection. Um, global profiles of aerosol properties. Um, you know, with Clipso, you had vertical profiles and some identification of type. Uh, mostly, uh, but it was mostly giving you the aerosol backscatter from which you can get the height and, and, and depth of the, the aerosol layer. Uh, but here uh, with a high spectral resolution LIDAR, we anticipate being able to get estimates of absorption, better estimates of type, as well as size and number concentration. And then because we are focused on uh, clouds and precipitation and aerosols together in ways that other missions have, and we have co-located dynamics, cloud and precipitation microphysics, and aerosol characteristics. With cloud and precipitation before, we had a limited number of coincident overpasses between CloudSat and TRIM and GPM. Uh, but here we're looking to be able to have continuous observations of those coupled properties. Uh, evolution of cloud and aerosol processes. And, and this is looking um, at primarily low clouds and aerosol plumes um, with a 
pair of stereo cameras. Uh, these cameras will be flown close together in time, maybe a minute or two apart. Uh, and the cameras look in two different directions so that you get multiple looks at the same feature and can detect the motion of those features. And so we expect to be able to get information on cloud top height, motion, and, and potentially vertical motion and entrainment rates for low clouds and aerosol plume height motion. And then finally, uh, you know, we, with TRIM and GPM, we've had the diurnal cycle of uh, precipitation from active profiling, and this would give us diurnal cycle information of active profile, profiling from, for clouds and aerosols in, a, uh, in terms of the diurnal cycle. And of course, its relevance to hurricanes is in terms of the impact of aerosols on deep convection in general, uh, but also in particular, when you think about the Atlantic, you get the Saharan air layer out there, and typically the African easterly waves that develop into tropical cyclones form along or just south of the southern boundary of the Saharan air layer. And there's been a number of studies that have argued that the Saharan air layer has an impact on tropical cyclone development, but it's not clear what the role of aerosols are versus the thermodynamic aspects of the Saharan air layer. And so at least we'll have um, coincident measurements of uh, aerosol and cloud and precipitation properties to maybe take a look at that. Uh, ACCP by no means, it was not designed specifically for hurricanes, but uh, was looking at convection in general. <clears throat> so throughout the ACP, ACCP study, uh, the team made every effort to be responsive to the Decadal Survey report, which spelled out a number of key science questions and objectives related to clouds, precipitation, and aerosols. Um, they had about 11 different uh, science objectives, um, and we we, we knew we couldn't try to hit all of those objectives fully that we had to prioritize. Uh, and in evaluating the architectures, we all, it helped to prioritize also uh, for our, what we, we did what we call a value framework uh, evaluation to look at the science benefit of different architectures uh, toward the science. And so we decided to focus on three of the most important questions. And I'll show that in just a moment. Uh, HTCP is also consistent with the key objectives in the NASA Earth Science Strategic Plan, particularly related to water and energy cycles, extending and improving prediction and reducing climate uncertainty. So we like to show and build up the schematic diagram as a way to highlighting the science here. So the three science questions from the Decadal Survey that we emphasize are convective storm processes, um, air quality processes and distribution, and climate sensitivity, cloud feedback, and aerosol forcing. Um, and, and let's see, it, so it starts with those three questions and then ultimately how they uh, connect or, or, or trace back to the broader overarching goal of characterizing the role of aerosols, clouds, precipitation uh, in weather, climate, and air quality models. <clears throat> so here we add in uh, key small scale processes that are critical to interactions between clouds and aerosols and determine uh, the properties of cloud systems and aerosol plumes and layers. So that includes things like nucleation, wet removal, and vertical redistribution uh, in terms of the interaction between clouds and aerosols, uh, and ultimately how that plays out in terms of the, the microphysical processes to determine the, the cloud uh, properties, and in terms of emissions, humidification, and, and, and short-term transport, how that determines aerosol distributions. Uh, the next set of arrows uh, here highlight the larger scale processes that are related to how clouds and aerosols drive global circulations, uh, vertically redistribute water and in chemical species and determine the forcing on long term weather and climate change. Um, so, for example, on the convection side, we have vertical transport, detrainment and the high clouds. Um, we have the radiative forcing of clouds at all levels and, and aerosols and how that feeds back to climate. Um, and then improving our understanding of these processes requires measurements of specific properties of the clouds and aerosols that are highlighted in the yellow boxes here. Um, these measurements in combination with a variety of analysis tools and what we expect for future uh, modeling systems and earth, earth science modeling systems uh, will help us to better understand some of these difficult to observe smaller scale processes and the forcing of global circulation, weather and climate. Uh, these measurement needs drove an analysis as part of the study of a broad range of sensor types, 
um, that were examined as part of the study. I think in the end, we ended up looking at about, from what I'm told, about 100 different architectures, although some we looked at uh, more deeply than others. Um, and this ultimately determined the suite of sensors that make up the ACCP observing system. Uh, and that includes multi-frequency Doppler radars, LIDARs, including HSRL capability, spectrometers for coupled radiation measurements, and a set of synergistic passive measurements, both passive microwave and polarimeters uh, that provide constraints on the retrievals and are of high value for applications. Finally, uh, it's important to recognize that the process, these processes span a wide range of timescales. In most circumstances, convection occurs on short timescales of a day or less, uh, with the exception of, say, hurricanes, while climate-related re processes occur on longer timescales of, of perhaps months to years. Aerosol processes span these two timescales, with emissions and local transport uh, occurring on shorter timescales. Uh, think of the diurnal cycle of biomass burning and things of that nature, and even the Saharan air layer has its own diurnal cycle. And then long-range transport removal and forcing occurs on longer timescales. This range of timescales motivated the exploration of both single and dual orbit solutions in the study. For example, uh, the right side of the diagram, which is focused on climate, really emphasizes the need for global coverage, including the poles, uh, and that has to be done with the polar orbiting satellite, uh, and it provides some continuity with past missions. Um, whereas on the left side, when you're dealing with convection and the shorter time scales associated with it, um, there you want to get after, you want to get an inclined orbit that's able to get at the diurnal cycle and eventually compositing over the, the, the day to get at how things evolve from formation of convective updrafts to increasing cloudiness and overall humidification of the atmosphere. So this slide uh, describes some of the core measurement capabilities, um, highlighting in particular what we always viewed as our core five. That includes on the active side, uh, radars, uh, multi-wavelength, at least two frequencies, potentially three, uh, and with Doppler capability. We had considered what we call delta T measurements, which are measurements of two identical instruments very close in time, like a minute or two apart to uh, inform time rates of change of different variables, but we ultimately did not do that for the radar. Um, we also have the LIDAR, uh, which has multiple ch uh, channels, including um, uh, HSRL capabilities. And then those are complemented by the passive measurements. So the radiometer uh, complements the radar. Uh, we realized early on that we could not reproduce GMI type uh, capabilities because of cost constraints. Um, and we had to utilize uh, small sat technologies here. So we were looking at radiometers that could provide um, high frequency capabilities. And, and this says 100 to 900 gigahertz. We are trying to push this down to about 85 gigahertz um, to have continuity with past missions at, at least uh, with that frequency. We also looked at doing these delta T measurements with it, but uh, in the end didn't make it into the final architecture. Uh, to complement the LIDAR, we have the polarimeter, which is a multi-wavelength, multi-angle polarimeter uh, that provides fairly powerful constraints on some of the LIDAR retrievals during the daytime um, and uh, is useful for applications. And then we have uh, a pair of spectrometers that together span wavelengths from UV to VIS all the way to the far infrared. And the primary uh, usage here uh, is to get ready to flux estimates coincident with the cloud and aerosol properties to be able to say something about the um, forcing of climate basically by clouds and aerosol layers. Um, we have other instruments that uh, gradually got added in, uh, although they tend to be the things that would probably be descoped first. One is the these tandem stereo cameras to provide some information on the dynamics of low clouds and uh, aerosol plumes. Uh, and then we had a couple of contributions from the Canadian Space Agency uh, for aerosol and moisture limb sounding. Uh, the primary goal there is for upper tropospheric, lower stratospheric uh, aerosol and moisture profiles. Um, next, I want to uh, highlight uh, some capabilities. Originally, I had both right, uh, radar and LIDAR in here, but I think I took out the LIDAR just for time constraints. So I'm going to just show you some highlights for the radar. Uh, these are simulations that Pablos Colias uh, produce um, showing capability for deep convection. Uh, this is just showing a squall line, but you can imagine similar capability 
for uh, tropical cyclones. Uh, we considered some US-based radars that would provide W and KA band capability and even KU capability, as well as uh, a potential JAXA contribution of a KU band Doppler radar. Um, all of that comes with a pretty heavy price tag, and we're still trying to sort out whether or not we can afford to do it. Uh, so the advantage of W band is you get better sensitivity, uh, less noise due to smaller footprints. Um, the the U.S. radars use a dual antenna approach called the display displace phase center antenna approach, which helps to beat down the noise and help a bit with uh, non uh, non uniform beam filling effects on the Doppler. Uh, JAXA has had one option that was single frequent uh, single antenna that leads to noisier. Um, signals and, and some edges, some effects on the edges of convection and, you know, for a more isolated convection would be more problematic. Um, but then the other issue is that with W band, you don't get much penetration of the convection. This would be more earth care like. And so we wanted to have KA band to get greater penetration and ultimately KU band to get full penetration of convection so that we can be characterizing the, the mass flux within these convective towers. Uh, for most most precipitation systems. If we're able to accommodate the JAXA radar, that would come with a wider swath similar to trim and GPM. And then finally, I uh, wanted to talk about the final architecture uh, selections. Um, so as I mentioned, we had about 100 different architectures at one point, and we developed a way to sort of prioritize the key measurements and all, and from that priority, prioritization, we narrowed it down to three uh, key architectures, two of which uh, have just a polar orbit in the solution. The downside of a polar orbit is that due to budget constraints, we can only launch as early as uh, 2031. Um, now, in this, in the first option, we have triple frequency radar where the KU is coming from JAXA, so we get wide swath at KU and near nadir or narrow swath at W and KA. Uh, these radars, the W band and KA band, would be capable of scanning closer to the surface than was possible with trim, GPM, and even CloudSat. Uh, so that's a, another advancement there. We have the radiometer. Um, the LIDAR, a three-frequency LIDAR with two channels having HSRL capability, uh, and then the 1064 being backscatter. A polarimeter with about a 550 kilometer swath and half kilometer resolution, the spectrometers, the stereo cameras, and then the CSA contributions. Option two really isn't that much different. Um, we wanted to have a lower cost option and the US Nader only KU option uh, provided the um, KU capability without swath for a pretty significant savings. So we decided to, to make that, a, it's a second second ar architecture rather than a D-scope because it had impacts on spacecraft bus and launch and other things. So we just decided to make it a, a second option. And then the third option is a dual orbit solution. The There's two key advantages to this. One is that you get the diurnally varying uh, evolution of clouds, aerosols, and precipitation. And the other is that because of the funding wedges that we have, it allows for an earlier implementation of the inclined orbit to do early science, more or less by the end of the decade that's covered by the decadal survey. And that was viewed as being of very high importance for NASA headquarters to be able to show that they accomplished something uh, within that decade. Uh, so some of the key differences, some of the capabilities were moved from the polar to the inclined orbit. So KU Doppler is moved to uh, inclined and it's only the, the Nader option and not, not the JAXA radar. Um, we had to drop the UV channel from the LIDAR uh, and the stereo cameras are, are moved from the polar to the inclined orbit. In the inclined orbit, we have a W band and KU band Doppler radar. Uh, the, uh, the same radiometer is in both orbits. Um, we'll have in this inclined orbit a backscatter LIDAR, very similar to the CPL image uh, or LIDAR uh, that does it's the low energy rapid pulse sort of uh, LIDAR, um, backscatter only. A polarimeter, but here for applications, we double the swath and reduce the resolution. And then we have the stereo cameras. So the earliest launch here would be in the 2028 timeframe. And then the second launch would still be in that 2031 timeframe. 
Uh, and I should say that headquarters is reviewing these recommendations and we expect to find by the end of the month, uh, we expect to get their recommendation uh, for what they want to see and, and to move into pre-phase A uh, of the mission. So in conclusion, uh, you know, TRIM led to a rapid expansion of tropical cyclone research that yeah, I think very quickly surpassed everything that it, a lot of what had been done with uh, aircraft observations and other satellites um, and, and really just led to a tremendous uh, expansion of the knowledge of these storms. GPM expanded tropical cyclone research to higher latitudes with better capability, but I think having it in the 65 degree orbit um, while the data is still very important for tropical cyclone monitoring, it, it did kind of get hurt by the fact that there's fewer observations per day from GPM. And if in a given day you don't get an overpass of a storm, it, it, you, know, you can go a full day without getting a good one. Um, but it did lead, I think, to a significant expansion of the applications related to heavy rainfall, especially with tropical cyclones. Uh, and, and, and that's where we see some of its key benefits. Tropics, you know, takes a, it's a new look at, uh, of, of doing things, uh, inexpensive mission to get rapid refresh observations. If this works well, you know, one can envision large constellations, you know, 30, 40 satellites up in space that give um, almost continuous goes like um, revisit rates. Um, uh, of these microwave measurements. There was for a while efforts to do passive microwave from a geosynchronous satellites, and this would be a way of doing it from low earth orbit with low cost measurements. Uh, that would be an alternative to a, a geo type platform. And then ACCP, uh, we, you know, it's not really geared toward hurricanes specifically, but it's a process oriented laboratory for studying these coupled aerosol cloud and precipitation processes. And that could include uh, processes within tropical cyclones. So I'll stop there and be glad to take any questions. Sorry if I ran a bit long. Thank you, Dr. Brown. No problem about running long. So if anyone has any questions for um, our speaker now, you can either raise your hand, um, which you can access through expanding the participants panel. It's right at the bottom. Or you can um, type your question in the chat. We already have one raised hand um, from Zuyan Gao. Um, Zuyan, you are unmuted. Thank you. Hello, Professor. Thank you for the great presentation. Um, I don't have much background in uh, tropical cyclones uh, or hurricanes or uh, disaster analysis, so I haven't used TRAM or GPM precipitation products, but I do use uh, CRU and GPCC precipitation products to uh, analyze climate change. And I know that GPCC and CRU precipitation products were derived in a different way. Um, but my question is, so uh, so what's the difference between the CRU and GPCC precipita precipitation data sets and the TRAM and the JPM precipitation products? And can we use the uh, TRAM and the GPM precipitation products in the same way as we use CRU and the GPCC precipitation products? Good question. Um, Bob Adler probably can answer it better than I can because I'm not as familiar with the specifics of, of how the GPCP uh, um, products were put together. But uh, yeah, I think it's a, uh, a similar product. Certainly over ocean, I would think that they'd be comparable. Um, and, and late iMERGE product does incorporate uh, ground-based observations. Uh, we know that we have some issues at higher latitudes uh, with some of the uh, orbital products, but a lot of that gets corrected in the iMERGE product. Uh, and so I, uh, my own opinion you know, with the, the GPM products now, they, they, they have been reprocessed back over the trim era. So they go back to about 2000. Uh, so about 20 years of iMERGE data. So in that sense, it's producing a record that would start to become more comparable with the GPCP results. Um, but I don't know if I can get into the the details of some of the differences. Okay. Yes. Yeah, since in the lecture you mainly talk about the uh, application of these precipitation products in tropical cyclone research, so I was wondering, can I use these like TRAM and GPM precipitation products in other climate change 
um, research. I, I would certainly think that that's doable. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, especially since we have 20 years of, of data now. Okay. So can we do like long-term um, temporal trend analysis with this product? I'll leave that to the experts who, uh, I mean, there's, all, there's still, there's changes in the observing system throughout that period, which complicate trying to do long-term trends. And I haven't necessarily looked at that problem myself, but um, one would have to factor that into the uh, analysis of trends. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Professor. And I'm not. I don't. Don't call me a professor. I'm not a professor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the question. Are there any others? I do have some, but people can be definitely putting in their questions as we read them out loud. So here's one question that was a text. What is the cause of early morning precipitation in the diurnal cycle? That I'm not totally sure of. I mean, we know that tropical oceanic convection also exhibits that early morning cycle. Uh, I'm not, you know, again, I'm not the expert in, uh, in the diurnal cycle, so I'm not sure why. I mean, we, have, we understand better why over land uh, the diurnal cycle peaks in the evening hours because of the daytime heating. It's a bit less clear as to why over the oceans, uh, and in particular, why in tropical cyclones it would peak in the early morning hours. Thank you. Are there any other questions? You can raise your virtual hand or just send to me a chat. Okay, well, doesn't sound like it. Yeah, okay. Well, in that case, um, well, thanks everybody for attending this seminar and thank you, Dr. Braun, for this great talk. We'll continue next week um, as our seminar series continues. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Braun. That's a great talk. There were thanks. some um, over 80 participants. So I, I think your talk has been well received. Yeah, you know, as, as I mentioned before, all timing goes out the window once I actually start giving it. it my 45 minutes easily went the hour. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I, I saw a lot of um, NOAA federal employees um, attending your talk. Um, so I think they might have some questions um, afterward. Okay. Yeah, I was surprised there were more about either HCCP or Tropics with those missions coming up. Uh, all right, so uh, we will send you uh, the, the video recording once uh, it's available. Um, and um, thank you so much. Sure, thank you for inviting me. <laughs>